We Need Each Other is a podcast about the importance of human interaction. It provides reminders that we are not intended to live in isolation. Human beings need each other. The things about another that pisses you off and the things that take you over the moon are all opportunities to see through another's eyes, recognize their intrinsic value, and then look more deeply within ourselves to find the love that's always there. I am here with my guest today, Camille Jones, and I'm excited to have Camille with me because of my own and society's growing concern regarding what is lacking in health care for Black women. There are alarming racial differences in maternal mortality. And Camille Jones is a PhD candidate in international nutrition with a focus on maternal child health. While earning her master's in public health, she began serving in the U.S. Peace Corps in Botswana and worked there for three years supporting HIV and AIDS prevention and treatment programs. I want to hear about that too, Camille. That's, that's interesting. She returned to the U.S. in 2017 and began her doctoral studies in nutrition. She spent the last year in South India working on a trial that focuses on improving the health of mothers and their babies. Currently, her research is in child nutrition and immunity, and her passions are in the maternal health of Black Americans. I am so excited to welcome you, Camille. Thank you for coming and speaking with us today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm honored, honored to talk to you. And I'm honored to have you because this is a very, very important topic right now. Um, I think, I, I well, for myself even, and I think for a lot of people, we didn't realize that there was such an issue until Beyonce and Serena made it mm-hmm. evident, you know, because we're like, if Beyonce and Serena can have issues, then then anyone, anybody, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. So um, I'm curious, in your opinion, and from your observation and education, why are Black women in the U.S. three to four times more likely to die from pregnancy-related causes than white women? Well, so I think the first, one of the first things that comes to mind, uh, kind of a, an easy guess, is the um, differences in access to healthcare. Um, but what we've seen is that even when they're, even when we do have access, um, the same access to healthcare, there are instances of uh, provider bias as well, right? So even as we saw in, in Serena's story where she voiced her concerns and was not mm-hmm. heard right away. Um, and, and we see that a lot. And, um, and so there's, I can, I can speak more to, um, the scientific community than the, mm-hmm. than as I'm not specifically a healthcare provider, but there on both ends, there is not as much trust, right. Between the black community and the health community, um, in that way. The other, um, the other piece, uh, that I find extremely interesting is the concept of weathering, which Mm -hmm. is the, uh, when sociological stressors have biological impacts. So if you think of your flight, your fight or flight mentality Mm -hmm. and that spike in stress that can take place, um, you know, with fears of police brutality or um, the stress of being perhaps the only black person in a workspace, mm-hmm. um, you know, every bit of systemic racism, those those stressors, even if your stress spikes just momentarily, it um, those changes in stress hormones can impact your body to uh, quicken aging over time. So, I mean, I love the phrase black don't crack. I, I mm-hmm. lean into it. I appreciate it. Um, but that speaks to something external and internally. Um, the question is whether black Americans age faster than our white so, counterparts. So we might be cracking on the inside, huh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. Mm. And so then in the context of maternal health, Um, what we've seen is that when you look at, um, pregnant mothers in their late twenties, early thirties, um, 
the compared to white mothers, um, black women show the risks of older white women. Um, and so those stressors that we take on in our day to day have impacts on, on our bodies and on our lives. It makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. So I'm curious what made you decide to go into this, to the study of maternal child health. Yeah. I watched as someone I love go through a very traumatic pregnancy and it was, a series of events that I, that we just completely did not expect to happen. And she was quite healthy and, um, it just, it felt like it came out of nowhere and it was painful and it was scary. It was, it was terrifying. And it was also surprising at every turn. Um, so between, the fear that I felt, um, with my friend's health and then walking into the NICU and just every step of the way was this kick in the gut of surprise Mm. along with the fear. Mm. Then months later, I found myself in a classroom, um, as part of my doctoral program at Cornell, where we were learning about maternal and child nutrition And you can't speak about maternal and child nutrition without seeing statistics on black women, because Mm. in any study that includes them compared to other ethnic groups, you just see spikes in the graphs Mm. for every health outcome, whether it's gestational diabetes, gestational hypertension, preeclampsia, eclampsia, infant mortality, um, preterm birth, everything you see these spikes Mm. and Every time we switched to that, we progressed to the next PowerPoint slide. I just felt that kick in the gut again, Mm. where I thought these are not, these are not just statistics. This is my life. Mm. And, but when I looked around, I saw that I was the only black graduate student in the room. Mm. And so Mm -hmm. thank you. I, I felt like there was no way I could leave that room and not sort of pivot my career interest to try to do something to bring more attention to this and more advocacy to this. I'm curious in your class, when you're observing and they're speaking of those spikes, are they given, are they giving any kind of reasoning as to why there would be those kinds of spikes? Do they explain? There's always the question. Um, I think that the answers, the determinants for those health outcomes can come from so many places. Um, And we were comparing different studies that measured different things as well. So it would have been, um, I think, overly speculative for us in that moment to come to conclusions. Mm -hmm. However, there's, um, you know, you can have environmental factors and the health of the mother prior to becoming pregnant, which is extremely important, but is also not measured as often. Um, Mm -hmm. When you think of designing a study of pregnant women, you know, Um, and so, and then, you know, the weight amount of weight that's gained during pregnancy and any, um, any um, health concerns that may have existed before. So there's so, there's so many factors that, that could be a component of it. Um, Mm -hmm that it, you could have a slightly different answer in each, in each study that you see. And so um, there are sort of general ideas, but in terms of being able to pave an absolute way forward, um, we haven't determined that yet. And it may be quite, dy- a quite, a, quite a dynamic way forward as well, because, um, because it's such a multifaceted problem, right? Mm-hmm. So if we have, say, if I'm to ride the wave of this, um, of the weathering concept, Mm-hmm. If we have a population of women who've experienced so much racism over their lives and over mm-hmm. generations mm-hmm. that their health is impacted, well, okay, you know, putting them on a vegetarian diet isn't going to do anything. Uh, <laughs> you know, that's, that's not mm-hmm. going to fix the problem. Mm-hmm. And, so, um, and so I think that it's really important to ask, to ask to challenge the big picture and to look at, okay, what are all the different components that go into your life and health prior to becoming pregnant throughout your pregnancy and after your pregnancy? Mm. So this is an area of deeper research that is occurring, needs to occur, 
has never occurred. It is occurring. It is occurring. Mm-hmm. Um, it's definitely needed more. Mm-hmm. Mm, that's interesting. Um, I, I'm curious if you can share at all. You said that one of the factors also for you was observing the pregnancy of your friend. Can you talk about what kinds of things you observed during that pregnancy? Are you able to talk about that? Um, I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit, mm-hmm. um, which is so um, it was that. So my friend was um, was not yet at a point in pregnancy where you should be going to the hospital. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, uh, the amniotic sac ruptured prematurely oh. and right. So, um, it was very scary. And, um, so the goal within the hospital was to sort of remain pregnant as long as possible. Yeah. Um, but it ended up resulting in an emergency C-section, um, and then about a month of stay in the NICU and there was also um, a, a period of time, I think what was scariest for me um, was the period of time when she was not able to be discharged yet because of high blood pressure, mm. um, which to me did not make sense at the time. And it wasn't until I was taking classes later mm. um, and began to learn about preeclampsia Um, and these maternal health outcomes that, um, made me sort of triggered fright all over again for me in this, in this really, um, personal experience of thinking I can't just sit and read a textbook or I can't just look at a, again, a PowerPoint slide and see these as sort of like a reel of anonymous stories or, you know, an aggregated collection of meaningless events. These are heartbreaking events and these are terrifying mm-hmm. events. Mm-hmm. And, um, and they mean the world to every single person who's involved in that. Yes, absolutely. Can you uh, explain to uh, the listening audience pre preeclampsia? Number one, you're, you're saying it's one of the things that black women are at higher risk for. Yes, it is. It, it is. is. And can you explain what preeclampsia is? Sure. It's high, higher blood pressure. Mm -hmm. Um, and so when, so, um, once you get close to delivering, um, if your blood pressure becomes too high, um, it can be, it can, if you're um, still pregnant, it can become fatal for both the mother and the child. And the only way to, um, to resolve it is to force delivery. Mm -hmm. Um, you can also have, and that's for preeclampsia. You can also have eclampsia, which is preeclampsia plus seizures. Mm. Um, and that has a much higher fatality rate. And this could be for a woman who never had high blood pressure before being pregnant. It could. I don't, um, I'm not as familiar with the science for, um, for looking at health history determinants of preeclampsia. Okay, cool. Very good. Thank you. So I'm curious how you, you've done this international study. How does your international study figure into your awareness about healthcare? Uh, you were studying, you were working with AIDS and uh, HIV research in Botswana. Yes. Was that so in Botswana? Mm-hmm. It was in Botswana. But um, so when I was in Botswana, the work I was doing um, was volunteer work with, um, with the U.S. Peace Corps. And I actually um, was not, introduced to research until my PhD program. Mm -hmm. And so, um, Mm -hmm. so I ended up having these two very strikingly different experiences in Botswana and in India because, um, well, the, the jobs were just very different, but Mm -hmm. in Botswana, my work was, um, program design and, and program design and development and a lot of, um, I would say team building so that we could um, sort of get these programs and projects off the ground. And I ended up doing, so I was there for HIV and AIDS related work, which is a very wide umbrella Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, under development. You can do a lot (laughs) under Mm -hmm. HIV and AIDS. You can, um, you know, work within education, work for NGOs. My work ended up being at a clinic and then at a hospital and I was focused, I became focused on the supply chain um, and wanting to make sure that patients got their medicine, which Mm -hmm. sounds 
pretty simple <laughs> um, in mm. theory. <laughs> but not um, so simple, huh? It wasn't so simple. And, um, and it ended up being um, a distinct gap in what was needed because, or in what was available because um, you could have the central medical supply of medicines that get shipped in from other countries and you can, you know, make your calculations for where they should go. But in terms of them actually getting to the last mile, um, always mm. seemed to be a challenge. Um, and so I helped design some of the logistics for my hospital, which was a district hospital, and we served um, 26 other facilities. And then um, I ended up staying a third year. The Peace Corps is typically a two-year assignment, but I stayed a third year and uh, worked with the United States Agency for International Development on supply chain, where we developed a program to train. We worked with Peace Corps volunteers who then worked with uh, local healthcare providers to um, to fine tune the last mile of logistics to make sure that the antiretroviral treatments for HIV, as well as your, all of the rest of your medications, like for hypertension and high cholesterol, um, pain medications, that everything was, that was required by the rural clinics and health posts mm. um, at each corner of the country, that they would get their medicines. Mm. Um, and so that ended up being a very large and very um, rewarding project that I had stayed for quite a while for. Um, and then in that time, I decided that I needed to stop doing that project and go back to school. <laughs> mm, uh, um, yeah. And so, and the reason was because I was able to see this large machine um, that of, of the federal aid that we, that the U S um, gives to countries, um, under PEPFAR. And so we're, um, having all of this HIV AIDS based programming and it's this, yeah, giant, giant machine. Um, and every project that had to do with HIV was fine tuned, well funded, did well. Um, but if it didn't fit that definition, then it may not be, um, it may not be included. And so what I was finding was gaps. Um, so for example, in the hospital I worked in, um, there is, so we would have, um, distribution of infant formula to mothers. So women who are living with HIV, who have an HIV negative child, um, would be provided free infant formula for the first year of the child's life, which is wonderful. So we've got that fully funded and it, you know, it's a great, great program. Um, but then what we found was that after 12 months of age, there were babies presenting at the hospital starving. Mm. And so it was like, okay, well, there's, there's a hole in the programming because we've taken care of, you know, we've checked the boxes for what fits in terms of, you know, the tasks that are required in facing this disease. But we didn't finish actually caring mm. for people. And so, um, and I was just finding the several different gaps such as that where, um, where the link that I felt was missing would have to do with food. Um, but it was always a hanging question, um, where it was sometimes I would meet people who, um, would have access to the antiretroviral medications, um, but would default on their regimen because they didn't have the food to take it with. Mm, wow. And so, mm. and it was, so it was just, it was strange or not strange, but I just had these questions of, well, you know, there's, there's something about disease and food that, um, that you have to pay attention to both. Mm -hmm. So I decided mm -hmm. to go back to school and started at Cornell for my PhD. And, um, and the lab that I work with specializes in the connections between nutrition and disease. And so what I was able to begin learning was this cycle, um, the cycle of nutrition and illness, where um, if, you're, if your nutrient intake is depleted, then your susceptibility to disease is increased. 
Um, and if there is, if you have illness, then your absorption of nutrients can decrease. And so Mm -hmm. it just continues this cycle of, of illness and malnutrition. And so as I've begun to learn this more, um, that's been sort of the undercurrent of my PhD projects. And so, um, and then the latter part of your question was about India. Um, and so I was in India for Mm -hmm. all of 2019, um, in a research capacity now. So instead of being there in a, you know, as a volunteer worker on the advocacy Mm -hmm. side was now there as on the research side. Mm -hmm. And for that experience, we, so we operate, we've been operating a trial that feeds, um, crops that have been bred, um, conventionally bred, just naturally bred to have higher concentrations of specific Mm -hmm. nutrients. Um, and we would cook South Indian meals with these crops. And so, um, we have the intervention arm who that of mothers and their babies who are consuming these, um, these specialized meals. Mm -hmm. And then you have, um, moms and babies in the control arm who are consuming identical meals, but with crops with just conventional crops, right. That have, that do not have those, um, higher concentrations of nutrients. Mm, And so, well, I can report back to you on that. (laughs) Okay. okay. Yeah. (laughs) So our our data collection was taking place through 2019 into 2020. Uh Um, and so I can I can get back to you in the, Ooh, in the sure like near to know. future. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, I, mm-hmm. I'm excited to know too. <laughs> well, you know, the I mean, just, it, it, prior to even talking about this, you're talking about the connection between nutrition and health, mm-hmm. and why are we not taught nutrition? Yeah, I tell you, <laughs> when I I have been on my own studying nutrition for forty some odd years now. You know, I've been a guinea pig Great. for it. And when I first turned to that focus for myself, why it happened, I can't tell you. I started practicing yoga and meditating and I don't know, something happened. <laughs> but I would I would go to my doctors mm-hmm. and ask them questions. Mm-hmm. And they knew nothing of nutrition because mm-hmm. it was not an area of study for doctors at all. And I'm in this new learning for myself personally about the importance of food and nutrients Mm -hmm. and minerals and, you know, and they, they could never answer my questions. They didn't know anything about it. So I'm so excited that this is an area of study and that, that you're involved in. What, what can we do? What can an individual do? What can a woman who wants to have a child and, 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 you know, to become pregnant and have a child, there's a lot of fear around that for black women these days in particular. What would you suggest that she might do? Um, as differently, cliched, maybe mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. as cliched as it might sound, my, my biggest response would be to take care of yourself mm-hmm. um, in both a physical and mental capacity because the two are, can be so connected. Mm -hmm. Um, and so even when we think about prenatal health, um, the health that, that those determinants that influence, um, your health in pregnancy during pregnancy, your, that baseline health, the health that you have the day you learn you're pregnant is influenced or is connected to the health you had one and two years before that, right. Or longer. And so, um, particularly when I think about the state that we're in, right, this year of chaos, this Mm -hmm. season of death and loss and stress and grieving, it's a lot of stress. Mm -hmm. Um, There's a lot of stress. And I think that the most critical thing that we can do, not just for ourselves, but for the next generation um, of people we bring into this world is to be as gentle as possible with ourselves now Mm. so that we can be as healthy as possible when we're bringing them in. Mm -hmm. How are you being gentle with yourself now? What are you doing for yourself? Oh, Miss Brand. Um, (laughs) (laughs) 
Um, well, I'm trying. So I will. Um, we're all trying. We're all trying. We're all trying. <laughs> um, I'm big on routines. And so for me, the less I have to think about the things that I have to do every day, um, the better. So I kind of go into an automate mode. Um, so I wake up early. I exercise. Um, I then, um, make a smoothie and while I'm drinking the smoothie, I sit down to my classes. I use a, um, a program that times the amount of time I spend doing deep Mm. work. So then, um, so I have like a set amount of time that I'm focusing and not paying attention to anything else. I have a set amount of time that I'm answering emails or in meetings so that I don't feel like I'm wasting that time. It's time that I've dedicated to it. Um, I set as realistic of goals as possible so that I'm not feeling guilty by the end of the day or the end of the week about how much I didn't do. Um, And I try to speak really nicely to myself. Mm -hmm. Um, I had someone once tell me um, that... I've been trying to become a plant mom this year. It's, it's been a little hit or miss, but I think I'm doing all right. (laughs) But um, um, I got some advice though, that said, um, you know, consider naming one of your plants after giving them your name so that when you speak to the plant, (laughs) you're nice to it. (laughs) You know, (laughs) um, and And so just, and practicing kindness in all my interactions. And I think that, um, in most of my interactions over these past few months, over this year, I tell myself before I go into the interaction, I tell myself, okay, Camille, there's a chance that this person might be having a really bad day Mm. and now go into your interaction. Oh, that's Um, great. And so, and I, that. Well, I hope that people also yeah. afford me that grace. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. um, and so, but I think finding ways here and there to kind of give myself grace and give grace to others um, has been helping me a lot. That's beautiful. Well, those are words of wisdom that should be taken and followed. That'll <laughs> that'll stop that weathering in your black body. <laughs> Right? Gotta take care of our black bodies. Yeah, lives. gotta take care of our black bodies and, and gotta assist each other in knowing how to take care of our black bodies because, mm-hmm. you, I mean, everything that you've said is just so profound because we do live under a, you know, everyone lives under stress. Mm-hmm. Everyone does. Yeah. But there's an additional stress to being black in America. Yes. There just simply is. Mm-hmm. You know, and I, and I think it's uh, in the eye of, America right now that they're understanding that in a way that they've never had to understand it. They don't have to now, but in a, in a way that they've never chosen to understand it before. Right. And, right. and because of that, the, the knowledge that you've, you've passed on is, is, is it, it's, it's vital. It's important. It's um, we need to know because in your age group, when you're when you're creating that building that dream creating that career doing the, you know like you're really in it that's when all the stress is happening that's when it's yes. exacerbated if you don't stop i i love it probably well i probably should be doing exactly what you're doing about focusing this much time to do this this much time to do this because i work for myself and i'm working all i feel like i'm working all the time Mm-hmm. And so sometimes I'll just take a day, I'm gone, I'm doing whatever I want to do, uh-huh. you know, but um, this information that you've passed along, I hope people take it and breathe it in and embody it and, 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 you know, and listen again, really, to get the deep value that you've passed along to us Thank as black you. people, but particularly as black women. And I'm so grateful that you're in this area of study. I hope more black women or black people mm-hmm. join you in, in it as well. Because as a black woman, listen to a black woman saying, I am in pain. You understand mm-hmm. she's really in pain. Mm-hmm. You understand you're speaking the same language. And that comes first before we can educate others from understanding. You must listen 
to their language. Absolutely. She's saying she's in pain. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I do feel quite inspired by the women I know. I think mm. that women in general and as, as, as absolutely black women, we are nurturers. Mm-hmm. Um, and I also feel very fortunate to know so many black women who are physicians and, mm-hmm. um, and other caretakers, mm-hmm. right? Mental health care providers, um, teachers, and we, we see each other, yes. um, and we know, yes. and, you know, and, and just as you mentioned also those, those stressors are certainly not diminished, um, with high education levels and, and no, being in the workplace. Abs- mm-hmm. Absolutely not. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it, I feel, I feel quite comforted in seeing the potential of our systems where in seeing the levels of empathy, uh, that exist within, um, the, these circles of, of super women, um, mm-hmm. that super I see women. in black women. Yeah. And, and so, I mean, our, when it comes to both science and, and healthcare, our country has a pretty drastic and violent history um, with black women, but I'm but I am I'm genuinely hopeful um, in looking into the future. I'm happy to know that we are here doing the work and investigating and providing education for and seeking education for ourselves and providing it for each other. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, it's I I'm I'm optimistic. Very good. You make me even more optimistic. I thank <laughs> you so much because we need each other. We do. We need each other. We, we have to remember that. It's, there's a reason that that's the name of this podcast, because we do not live in a world alone. So I'm grateful for you. And I, I'm knowing that your circle of women that are on this path expands and expands and expands because we need you. Thank, Thank you for your dedication. Thank you so, it's so much. Good to we see need you. you. It's yes. so nice to see you. <laughs> yes. Yes. Because it's, what when we're recording the podcast, people don't understand that we're actually looking at each other, but all you yeah. Know, <laughs> and so it really is a wonderful thing for me to be able to see these faces uh, because I've known Camille for many years and haven't seen her in a long, long time. So Very this has been time. good. Yes. All right. Well, you take care. Thank you Thank so you much. For being you too. Here. All Thank right. you so much for having me. Absolutely. Thank you for saying yes. Thank you.